So don't be alarmed. I'm, I'm not like this infectious germ piece. I'll, I'll, I'll use sanitizer and everything before we do any type of communion and stuff like that. So, Oh, we're on. How long have I been on? Oh, good. Okay. We could live with that. Uh, we're in the final night of Jesus' life, and we've been in that. In fact, after tonight, we enter into the final narrative of Jesus' life. Really, the events of the betrayal, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ. So this is really like the last, I would say up until after the resurrection, this is really the last, and, and if I could even call it this, like teaching section uh, where Jesus is talking, where Jesus, and of course, and this is an actual prayer, uh, Jesus is leaving the earth. His disciples, he told, he's told his disciples that this is happening. And way back in John 14, he began comforting them. Uh, he's been doing that up through chapter 16. And in chapter 17, we see this prayer. And, and the prayer started with Jesus uh, praying for his disciples, specifically those 11, for their protection and for their sanctification. It moved to Jesus praying for all believers of all time, praying for, for their unity. We looked at this last week, praying for their unity. But remember, what was the key thought there about, what's the key qualification about unity, the unity of believers? Never at the expense of truth. There is no unity without truth. All right, so he prays for unity, but there is no unity without truth. There is no unity without doctrine. And today Jesus closes his prayer. And it's just a small section we're looking at today. We're just really looking at three verses. But this part of the prayer is important. And I didn't want to just kind of lump it in with the end of what we were looking at last week. Today Jesus closes his high priestly prayer. And he prays that all genuine believers would be with him in eternity. Look at John 17 and verse 24. <clears throat> Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so here Jesus prays that all genuine believers be with Jesus in paradise. And you'll see that Jesus desires this. He he longs for us to be in his presence. I mean, if you think about that just for a second, that the God of the universe longs, desires a relationship with you. The God of the universe desires and longs for a relationship with us, with you. And if there is a strain in that relationship between you and God, it has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with you. God longs for and desires for you to be in good standing with him and to be with him in eternity. And Jesus expresses that in this prayer. Now, I, I think about this kind of from the standpoint of a parent. Now, what parent would prefer to be in a bad relationship with their kids? You know, that's just not how parents, that's not how we think, right? We, 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 we want to be in a good relationship. The, the thought of one of my kids becoming estranged from me, that's a painful thought. That's a, that, that, like, to me, that, that's like not, that is not an option for the most part. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, would, would any parent long to have a, a poor relationship with their children? No, they wouldn't. God longs for a relationship with us. Jesus longs for a relationship with us. The father longed for it so much that he made the greatest sacrifice that could ever be made, his one-of-a-kind son. So we see here, uh, Jesus desires that they whom you have given me be with me where I am in glory, that they may see my glory which you have given me. So there in heaven for a time, I mean, let's assume, for the sake of the argument, let's assume that we're going to die, all right, um, before Jesus comes back. So then we'd be with him in paradise, and then we would come with him back, and we'd be here 
on earth for a thousand years, and then we'd be in a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity. But here, Jesus' desire is that we would be with him and that we would see his glory. Now, the disciples had seen some of that glory. Can, we give, can anyone give any examples of the glory that they saw of Jesus? I can think of one instance that stands out maybe more than any where they saw his glory. That would be it. The, the transfiguration. When they stood with Jesus on the mount and they saw him and he was changed before them, right? So they saw just, just, a, just a picture, just a, a glimpse of Jesus' glory. Uh, so they had seen some of his glory. They had seen some of his miracles. They had seen things, you know, pretty wild things, right? Like walking on water for real, like not just, uh, you know, there are, there are magicians today who have glass under the water and they, they, they do these, this deception and stuff like that. But Jesus walked on water on the Sea of Galilee, right? He, he healed people. He uh, brought Lazarus back from the dead and other things like this. So they, they had seen some of his glory, but they hadn't seen all of it. One day, when we are with him where he is, when he ascends up into heaven and sits down at the right hand of God, we will see his glory. We'll see him as he is. We will be in his presence and see all of his glory and all that pain and all that suffering that we know will be gone. All the sin that we know will be gone. As we talked about, a few weeks ago, one more thing I want you to notice <clears throat> or think about with this phrase. The first, I think it was two weeks back, John 17 verses 1 through 5. We saw that God does not share his glory. God the Father does not share his glory. And yet, in John 17 and verse 5, Jesus prays, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory that I had with you before the world was. We saw back in the beginning of this prayer in chapter 17, verse 5, that Jesus had glory with God the Father before the foundations of time, before the world was. And here we see also that we one day will see his glory. We will see Jesus' glory. And we see his pre-existence. You loved me before the foundation of the world. That he was existing in eternity past. And so the first part of this, just this little section that we're looking at today, deals with Jesus' prayer about us. That genuine believers will be with him in, for all eternity and that we will see his glory. But that can only happen. That doesn't happen ever. You know, there's some people out there, they're like, oh, you know, uh, one day... We're all going to be with God, you know, and, and, and it's really kind of more of a belief in universalism. Anyone want to tell me what, what universalism would be in that context? Universalism when it comes to salvation. Anyone? So their belief would be that everybody goes to heaven, right? That's a universal belief like universalism. But that's not, that's not the case. Everybody doesn't go to heaven, right? You know, we see there are people who actually think, right? Uh, we see there are people who actually think that they're going to, I think it was Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, who actually think they're going to be saved, who actually think they're going to heaven, who actually end up going to hell. And many people like that, Jesus says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty, many, many works in your name? And yet I will say unto them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So listen, Jesus' prayer, his longing is that we be with him for all eternity. But that can only be hap that can only take place by faith in Jesus Christ. We can only be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and we see that kind of hinted at in verse 25. Oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Uh, so 
you can only be saved, and we see this, we see this phrase show up a few times, this word show up a few times, the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And so there's a knowledge that's involved, that's essential. You cannot be saved if you don't know God's truth. You can't be saved if you're ignorant of the gospel. You can only be saved if you place your faith in what God has revealed. And what is that truth? Well, that, that's the truth of the gospel. It's the truth that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God. You're a sinner who is in trouble with God. You're a sinner by birth and by choice. I mean, even the good things that you do are somehow tainted by sin. It's not just what we do because we think about sin that way. Sin is not just something that we do. It's stuff that we think. It's, it's the stuff that's good that we don't do. That is, we know there's stuff that we should be doing and we don't do it. That's sin too. It's called the sin of omission, right? So I know I'm supposed to be reading the word of God. I know I'm supposed to be praying. I know I'm supposed to be going to church, whatever. And I don't do those things. Well, that's sin. So I sin in actively in the things that I do. I sin in, in the way that I think. I sin in sometimes the things that I don't do that I know that I should do. And it's not just those things, though. It's, it's that my whole being is permeated by it. At the fall of man, I mean, all of creation falls. My whole self is permeated by sin, such that even the good things that I do, I mean, Isaiah says, you know, all of your righteousnesses, Isaiah 64, 6, all of your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Even the good things that I do are tainted by sin. Sin is part of the core of who I am. And that means I'm in trouble with God because God is a holy, just God. And he demands a penalty against sin. His he has a holy wrath against sin, and that anger, anger, the scriptures say that. That God is angry against sin, that we have offended a holy and righteous God, and that that wrath against sin needs to be satisfied. There's a penalty for it, and, and the way I often describe it when I talk about the gospel, I always bring up something, I don't always bring it up, but I, but I think in terms of uh, like people are like, well, you know, the, the idea of God having wrath, they'll be like, the idea of God having wrath doesn't sit well with me. I don't like the idea that God is angry. Let me, let me help illustrate that for you just for a second. And I always say, think about the person you love more than anyone on this, on this earth. I mean, you may not have one. You may have a whole bunch of them. But think of one of the ones that are really, maybe, maybe it'd be your spouse, right? Or, you know, your spouse and your kids or whatever. Or if you're a younger person, maybe it's your mom. Dad always gets, dad always gets second place. You know, mom always, why does dad always get second place? Whatever. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's mom, right? And uh, there's nothing like a mother's love. But uh, imagine someone murders that person. Are you going to be like, we're good. Let's, uh, you find the murderer and you say, uh, hey, let's go out for some coffee. All right, let's, let's go for, uh, maybe, you're, you, maybe you're in a tea. Let's do some tea. You know, one, one cube or two, right? <laughs> you're not going to sit down and have tea with that, with that guy. You know, you're going to want justice. There's going to be an anger. A few years ago, we did a funeral for a guy that was murdered. Pizza delivery guy, Richard Labar. Right up, he, was a pizza, he, was a, he worked for Domino's Pizza up in East Stroudsburg, and he got murdered in the middle of brutally murdered by a couple of Cretans for something like 50 bucks or something like that. He believed that, and I'm going to tell you, that family, they were angry. They were angry. Because the person that they loved, who was working, I think, two or three jobs, if I remember, or he was working overtime or whatever, he was a guy who had, who had been retired, and he went back to work in order to put his kids through college. That's why he was working. And he got brutally murdered by some Cretans. They were angry. You know what? I was angry. Still, when I think about it, I'm angry. 
Right? We had a state senator that was here. He was angry. With the, the, the place was, the, this place was full. The, it was full of people who were angry. They were angry at injustice. They were angry that this guy, who, listen, by no means a perfect person, right? None of us, none of us is perfect. But who didn't do anything wrong except his job. All he was doing was delivering pizza up by the university and got murdered. They were angry. That helps illustrate just a tad about the wrath of God. God is a God who is, he's, he's got wrath. He has wrath against sin. And that wrath needs to be satisfied. And his justice needs to be satisfied. Otherwise, he's not just. And so we're sinners who are separated from God. This is the truth. This is what you need to know. Sinners who are separated from God, we can't save ourselves. There's no good thing that we could do to satisfy God's wrath. No sacrament, no, no nothing, no anything. God is just and he must punish sin. And yet he is also a loving God who, as we saw in verse 24, longs to be with us. He longs for a relationship with us. He doesn't want to punish anyone. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. And we see that in 1 first, uh, first Timothy 2 and verse 4. We see it in, I think it's 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. It might be 1 Peter 3, 9. He longs for a relationship, and that's why he sent his son Jesus. Jesus, as we saw, had glory with the Father before the world existed. And he left that glory to come and live in human flesh, but he lived a perfect life and therefore was a perfect offering for sin. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's what scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He takes our place. He becomes our substitute and God's wrath against sin and his demand for just penalty against sin is poured out and fulfilled at the cross when he takes your place and dies on your behalf. That's the gospel. That's the gospel message. And in order to have everlasting life, in order to be with him for all eternity, we need to receive that free gift of salvation. We need to repent. We need to turn away from our sin and turn toward God. Now, some people at times have gotten confused, especially from a, your, if you're from a tradition that misdefines the term repentance. Uh, when we talk about repentance, we talk about a change of mind. I'm changing my mind such that I turn away from my sin and I turn towards God in faith. I stop trusting in myself. I stop trusting in uh, whatever sacraments I thought could save me. I stop trusting in my own goodness and all that stuff. And now I am completely transferring that trust over to what, cre what Christ did on the cross. That is how I'm going to be. If that's not how I get saved, then I'm not getting saved because it's the only thing I'm relying on. That's what we're talking about when we talk about initial repentance. I turn, I change my mind about my sin, about how I'm saved, such that I turn away from that sin. I'm no longer okay with it. I turn away from my sin and I turn towards him in faith. And then I take up my cross and I follow him. That's really what a person needs to know in order to be with him for all eternity and see his glory. And we see some of those elements here in verse 25. For instance, look at the beginning of verse 25. <clears throat> oh, righteous father. Jesus prays to his father and calls him righteous. And he's already used this terminology. He called uh, the father, holy father, back in verse 11 in this prayer. And John, the writer of this gospel, will use a similar term uh, when he writes later on in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we see that God is a holy God, a righteous God, and that we, we, we know, of course, also that he will by no means clear the guilty, Nahum 1.3. His judgment is perfect. Unfortunately, I think people in the world today kind of reject that truth. They do. They definitely do. They reject that. And they won't come out and say, I don't believe God is righteous. But they say something similar because they set themselves up as the standard of morality. And that comes out in things like, and you've heard me say this before, comes out in things like, my God would never dot, dot, 
stop. Right? You ever hear that? Anyone ever say that before? My God would never. You've heard it, right? Perhaps. You've even said it. My God would never condemn someone to an eternity in hell, for instance. When you do that, you set yourself up as God. Your personal sense of morality becomes higher than what God says is true, and you're God. You create a God of your own liking based on you, based on your own sense of justice. You are God. You are just, and he isn't. That's, that's what it is. That's how it is. That's, that's how people reject God's righteousness. But he is perfectly just and he's perfectly righteous. And his precepts, as we see in Psalm 19, we see in Psalm 119, we see all over scripture, his precepts are good and right. We see that the world has not known you. So we see kind of where a person is without Christ. A person who's not going to be with him. A person who's not going to see him in all his glory. And the world, they have rejected that truth. Remember, we've talked about this. We've, talked, we've used this term week in and week because we're, we're, we're looking at the, the term world every week, aren't we? It's showing up in the, te the text of scripture every week. The world is, anyone want to give us a definition on that? Just even just a short version. Anyone? Tell me what the world is. All right. The Satan dominated system. The world is a Satan dominated system. She knows it all. Claudia says, I know it all too well. We were just talking about this a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago, talking about this. The world is a Satan dominated system that stands against God and his people and seeks their destruction. And the world has rejected God. It stands against God. It's not just the fact that it's rejected it. It's, a, it's opposed him. And it stands against his people. And it's characterized by the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And the world has suppressed the truth in unrighteousness, we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And so the world is damned. It's damned to pay the penalty of its sin. Because it has rejected the only means of its salvation, it has not known you. And so we see that pre-salvation position of the world, where they are. They have not known you. And then we actually see the intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. Yet I have known you. Father and Son know each other in a perfect way. Remember, they've had perfect, they have perfect knowledge for all eternity, and they existed in eternity past. They had glory together, and Jesus is already praying that that glory would be restored. And then we see something. Let's call this a negative positive. Contrast. The world has not known you. That's the negative idea. And these have known that's the positive idea. We see the great contrast that's set up between the lost and the saved. Once again, in John's writings, and by the way, John's going to go, he's, he's going to really write more about that in his first letter. Uh, you see, find that first John, it's like the fourth to last, let's see, Revelation, Jude, third, second, fifth to last book in New Testament. All right. This great contrast between the world and the believers. And by the way, the, the, they're stressed. The believers are stressed. This word is stressed. These have known that you sent me. The world rejects the truth. Genuine believers know it. And so Jesus prays that all genuine believers be with him in eternity, and he longs for that. But the only way that can happen is if you place your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. There's no other way. And Jesus says that. Anyone tell me where Jesus said that? Tell me what he said. There's no other way that a person could have everlasting life but by Jesus. Can anyone tell me? Give me the Bible verse. You guys are asleep. I'm trying to wake you up a little bit. I know it's a little warm in here. John 14, 6, anyone want to quote it? 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Can, uh, did anyone else, like maybe Peter? The Apostle Peter Petros? Anyone know what he said? In Acts 4.12? Let's give someone else a chance. You, you've gotten like the last four or five, so let's give someone a chance here. <laughs> you got 100. You got 100 today. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Acts 412, neither is there. Come on, somebody's got this. What's that? Neither is there salvation in... What's that? Okay, that's close. Okay. Um, um, man, you guys are really taking the air out of me today. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is. I quit. I quit. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you start from the beginning. You, 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 you. <laughs> Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. Under heaven, given among men, whereby, something like that. Given under, he uh, under heaven, whereby we must be saved, right? There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. And that genuine salvation, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, the only way a person could be saved. Remember, Jesus longs for that. He longs for us to be saved. He longed for Israel to be saved. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone those who were sent to her. How I have longed to gather you together, right? Yet you are not willing. That genuine salvation results in biblical love. And we see that in verse 26 at the, the very end of Jesus' prayer here. And I have made your name known to them. I will make it known. And we see this result, this result phrase here. So that. Now, some people would say this is purpose. And, you know, when I was taking Greek syntax, I always struggled with purpose and result. And I always, I, I always had a hard time seeing the difference between the two. I, I always felt like there were two circles and that those two circles kind of like were intertwined, that there was maybe like a little bit of a nuanced difference between the two, but that oftentimes they just kind of crossed over. You, you, know what I'm, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say here? So, so is this a purpose statement? Is this a result statement? So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So maybe there's purpose there, why Jesus made the name known, but there's at least result. There's at least a result of it to a certain extent. Jesus has given God's truth to his disciples. Uh, he revealed the Father to them over the last three years, and the greatest manifestation of that will take place the very next day when Jesus willingly offers himself as a voluntary sacrifice on the cross. The purpose of it, perhaps the result, the purpose of it, is love. God's love is in his disciples. God's love is extended to them. And because of that, they are able to display that love to others. The, the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. If we have the love of God in us, we can display that love. We can. Now, I want to talk about this just for a second. And this is kind of like a little side thing. We see this term love, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. God has love for his son, Jesus. He has love for the entire world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one-of-a-kind son, so that whosoever would believe in him, whoever might believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now contrast that idea of love. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. Now, um, greater love hath no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Contrast that with the way the world thinks about love today, right? Uh, I know I talk about this all the time, but I just don't want you to miss the point. 
especially young people. I don't want you to miss the point. I don't want my kids to miss the point. I don't want the Macarons kids or, or, or Mia to miss the point or any, the White's kids or anybody's kids, the, the Nivelts. I don't want anyone's kids to miss the point, all right? What, what biblical love is. Is emotion involved in love? And sometimes it is, yeah, yeah, often, right? Of course. God longs for a relationship. We see that emotion there in verse 24. God is grieved over sin in our life. We see that. But God's favor toward us is not based on emotions. It's based on truth, all right? And biblical love is not emotion necessarily, or at least it's not emotion void of action. It's action. That is, God loves by doing. In this way, God loved the world. It could be translated in John 3, 16. He loves by sending his son to die in our place, and that's how we love. We love by doing, not necessarily subjectively feeling, because that's how the world defines it. You know, when people get married, they make a, a vow to, to love one another until death do they part. And what they usually mean by that is I, they, they, they're thinking in terms of, of some level of subjective feelings that they have for a person that in truth is sometimes hard to control and direct, right? They're thinking of some subjective level of feelings, which is temporary and comes and goes, and that their commitment, a, a, a resulting commitment that goes along with that, but that that resulting commitment is only based on a minimum level of that subjective feeling. In other words, for kids, and if you, if you didn't hang with that, if you're an adult, is if I feel a certain amount of emotion, then I'm going to continue to be devoted. And if I don't feel that amount of emotion, then I'm not going to be devoted anymore. Does that make sense? That's how people think about love. So they think about love based purely on at least a minimum level of subjective feeling. The heart wants what the heart wants. You love who you love, you know, and all this foolishness. I fell in love. I was smitten by Cupid's arrow. It was outside of my control. And then I fell out of love. I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. <laughs> that's, that's how the world thinks about it, right? That's just not truth. That's just not what Scripture teaches. It's not. I teach couples that when they're making vows to each other, they're making a vow to remain faithful in spite of feelings. That feelings are not a part of the... Hey, listen, you can, you can direct your feelings. You can direct your emotions. You can guide your heart. Don't follow it. The heart is deceitful above all, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the way the world thinks about love and the way the Bible describes it are not quite the same. The be all end all of love is sacrifice and action. Not separated entirely from emotion, but not based on it either necessarily. A biblical love requires hard things sometimes. For instance, church discipline is an act of biblical love. We've done that in the past here where, by the way, if you're not a member of the church, then church discipline is not something that really applies to you because you haven't really agreed to be under the watch, care, and discipline of the local church. And so we, we, we wouldn't do anything. If a person's living in unrepentant sin, then they have not agreed to that accountability, and there's, there, is no, there is no church discipline in that situation. But for people who have joined a church and they have agreed to a, the watch, care, and discipline of the local church, they're placing themselves under the accountability of the local church, and is it loving to see someone continuing an unrepentant sin, knowing that the way of the transgressor is hard, knowing that the ultimate end is their destruction? Is it, is it love to say, I don't want to offend them? I know they're driving blindly 100 miles an hour in fog at a cliff that they don't know is there, and that eventually, if they're not warned, they'll go right over the edge, right? But I'm just going to... I don't want to hurt their feelings. Is that love? That is not love. It's not. In church discipline, you're warning someone. You're warning someone of the cliff that's ahead. 
Well, I would argue that that's hate. I would actually argue that that's hate and not love. But in church discipline, you're warning them of danger that lies ahead and you're calling them to repentance. In fact, it's, I mean, it's language that we see in the New Testament. James, let a person, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And so love isn't all just about feeling and, and, and stuff that feels and sounds good and makes people feel better about themselves. Sometimes it involves hard things like church discipline. Sometimes it involves sacrifice. And of course, the greatest display of sacrifice takes place at the cross. That's not an easy thing. I would say one of the best ways to love today for the church is to share the gospel. I think some people miss the point of the gospel. They think it's a message of hate. But the gospel is a love story. It's about God's love for mankind. And it is the greatest message of God's love for the world. Christ revealed himself. He re revealed the Father. I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. It's through the truth of God that we have Christ in us. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit comes and lives within us and has a dwelling place within us and convicts us concerning sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so in Jesus' high priestly prayer here in John 17, and all of it, from verse 1 all the way up through the end of verse 26, he prays for his disciples, for their protection. He prays for all believers that we'd be with him for all eternity. And the only way that can happen is if you place your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross. He is the only way. There is no other way. And genuine believers who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ understand and know God's love and we can live it out in our lives. And I would ask, is that a description of your life? Are you a person who understands and knows God's truth? Have you repented such that you've turned away from your sin and turned toward Christ in faith? That you've placed your faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross? Are you 100% sure that you'll be with Jesus Christ for all eternity and see him in his glory? And as a result, do you display that love to the people around you? Do you share the greatest truth that people can ever see? Do you make the sacrifice to tell people about the gospel? Or are you okay keeping it in and letting all those people in the world who don't know the truth, letting them not know the truth? Are you okay with them driving blindly towards a cliff, not knowing that it's leading to their destruction, and you sit there and say nothing? That's not love. The genuine believer places his faith in the cross. He displays God's love to the world, and in eternity will be in the presence of God, and will see Jesus in all his glory. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation. Just you, me, and, you, me, and God, no one looking around. You're here today, and you're not 100% sure you're saved. I don't know that I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to know. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you privately. I don't know that I'm saved. I see that hand. I don't know if I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know. Anyone else? Just raise your hand up so I can see and pray for you. I won't say your name. I won't embarrass you. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. I can see that hand. You know you're saved, but God has convicted you today, and there's some things in your life you want to repent about. You'd like me to pray for you? Anyone here? You know, I know I'm saved, but God is, God is working on my heart today, and I, I just like your prayers. I see that hand. I see that hand. See it. See it. See it. Anyone else? God is working on my heart today. I'd like you to pray for me. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we praise you and thank you, knowing that you are the one true God, and there is none other. I pray for these who are unsure of their salvation. I pray that 
you would have them to continue to hear your truth and your gospel until they know its message and they know that they've come to rely upon it and it alone. I pray that you would continue to convict them until they are saved. And if it's an assurance issue, then I pray that you would help them figure that out too. I pray for these whom you, your spirit has convicted, and I pray that you would work in their hearts. You know each one of them. Uh, you have a relationship with each one of them. You know them by name. You know the very hairs of their head, and you long for a relationship with them. I just pray that you would continue to work in them for your glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Uh, we're going to turn to 331, and we're going to close this part of our service with a hymn, and then we're going to take communion.